Point is lesson. The Gentiles warning. <clears throat> now I do want to talk about the Gentiles here briefly, but in a minute. But first I want to jump back to the Jews just for a moment. Because there's a dangerous potential for failure when we fail to learn from the past. When Paul was ministering to souls, doing his best to lead them to the truth, there was a significant majority of Jews in this newly formed organization who were unaware that their behavior had carried over into Christianity and was leading souls to their destruction. Being the source nation of the Messiah, many of the Jews had become proud of their heritage to the point that they could not recognize their own shortcomings. In any group of people, newcomers will always learn from those who are more well-established. This, is not, this not only applies to their good and proper behaviors, but also to those traits that are not so beneficial to their growth. Jesus had warned the Jews of this dangerous behavior. He said in Matthew 23 and 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For he come a sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Now those to whom Jesus was speaking, they weren't Christians. But it would seem at least some of the, the Jews carried this mindset into Christianity after they were converted. The Jews then, being more established in the law and history of their people, were the natural leaders of the Gentiles when they began to enter into the church. All of the apostles and early leaders of the church were of Jewish heritage. They had been exposed to this hypocritical behavior throughout their lives. We even see that Peter was drawn away by hypocrisy after the day of, after the day of Pentecost, showing that even Holy Ghost-filled individuals are not immune to this type of attitude, this behavior. Galatians 2, 11 through 13. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. This is Peter speaking once again. Because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And other Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Their behavior was the epitome of hypocrisy. This is the precise situation that motivated Paul to write Galatians 2 and 20. He, when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now if Peter, an apostle, a charter member, and a Holy Ghost-filled individual could be drawn away, what makes anybody think that they're immune to this type of behavior today? All that I've said so far speaks to the instigators of the behaviors that this lesson warns of. And that's unlikely that we'll ever be fully rid of that evil influence in the church. Jesus in the parable of the wheat and the tear said, let them grow together. Then at harvest, they'll be separated. Paul said in Acts 20, 29 and 30, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Excuse me. If this was a real and present danger then, with Jesus so fresh on the minds of individuals, with apostles still alive and leading the church, then how much more so today? We must be aware of the evil influences that surround us and look to God to help us to avoid being influenced by them to our destruction and also to help us avoid influencing others to their destruction. 
This is a warning that all of us would do well to understand how it applies to our modern lives and take heed. The commentary this morning, Paul could not conceal the fact that his heart was burdened for his people, the Jews, because he, they had stumbled at that stumbling stone, which is Christ, making him a rock of offense rather than a rock of their salvation, the rock of their salvation. But he endeavored to keep this turn of events in the proper perspective. Even before Paul's conversion, it was clear that his people were stumbling. In fact, he was their chief persecutor of any who had accepted the truth of the gospel. But when God called him from the dust of Damascus Road, he had already told Ananias, God had already told Ananias, that, he had been, that Paul had been chosen as a zealous, even though he was a pers zealous persecutor, in order to bear the name of God to the Gentiles. But some 750 years earlier, the prophet had said concerning the promised Messiah, Is it, a light? it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Isaiah 49 and 6. Now the word Gentile means basically nations. Everybody. Jesus was sent, according to this, 750 years earlier, as a prophet, as a savior for the Gentiles. Now Christ had come and fulfilled His earthly mission. And he had called Paul his chosen vessel to perpetuate this ministry to the Gentiles. It's no marvel that one should desire the salvation of his own people. It was only natural that Paul should yearn for the salvation of the Jews. Nevertheless, he would not neglect his apostleship to the Gentiles. Here he says, in effect, I am speaking to you Gentiles as your apostle. In fact, I glory in the special ministry, just as I glory in the cross of Christ. For in Christ Jesus, being either Jew or Gentile is not the important thing. But being new creatures is what counts. In brief, Paul was ready to fulfill his calling to the Gentiles, even when it came to warning them against boasting in God's present favor. He was writing to members at a predominantly Gentile church, and there was some evidence of at least a subtle spirit of superiority, which Paul felt responsible to warn against. Now, we need to be aware that when one group or one individual is given a warning, it also applies to those who may not have been initially included. When Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and Sadducees, scribes, lawyers, and elders of the Jews, he was speaking to us as well. Matthew 23 and 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye come a sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Now the Jews had been overly aware of their chosen status as the people of God. As a result, this led them to belittle others. So then is it any wonder that when they, did, when they did bring new people into their ranks, those new individuals learned the same behavior from them? There was a picture of a saying hanging in my aunt's house that always caught my attention and remains firmly implanted in my memory. It said, There is so much bad in the best of us and so much good in the worst of us that it hardly behooves any of us to talk about the rest of us. If we'll remember this truth, it will go a long way in helping us to avoid the warning of this lesson. A feeling of superiority is always, always sinful. Always. It will only ever lead to our own destruction and the destruction of the souls whom we influence. 
Consider the words of Jesus from Matthew 23 and 12. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Now I want to pause right there. It's not in my notes. But that word whosoever, we, we, I, my Nick's aunt, she used to always talk about that word whosoever. It means anybody. Whosoever will can come to Jesus. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter who you used to be, anybody can come to Jesus. Whosoever. And here Jesus uses that same word. Whosoever. Whosoever shall exalt himself. What's that mean? Anyone. Does that mean anyone outside of the church? No. Does that mean anyone who's a sinner? No. Does that mean anyone who's only a Jew? No. That means anyone, anybody, any person. If you're alive and breathing and, and your brain functions in such a way that you can think and, and, and recognize the difference between good and evil, anyone who shall exalt himself shall be abased, shall be brought low. Add to that, Paul's description of Jesus from Philippians 2, 5 through 8. He said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Add to that Romans 12 and 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. Also, 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, this is, this is an important one. <laughs> Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. We must be self-aware if we hope to avoid this trap of the enemy. We need to be able to see ourselves the way God sees us. This is clearly a serious problem or it wouldn't be mentioned so frequently. Once again, these, these that I brought out, I, there's four, four passages here, but these are just a very few passages of the many that warn us of this same type of attitude, this lifted up attitude that people have a tendency to get. Yes? This kind of reminds me, I was thinking about this thing the other day, and uh, I, I was just now comparing it to construction. On the ground, you're much safer than if you're working up on the scaffold. If you're up on the <laughs> scaffold, you can fall. If you're down on the floor, if you fall, you're not going to fall for as long as we keep ourselves low. We're in a safer place. That's excellent, excellent analogy. <laughs> the, higher, the higher God lifts us up closer to Him, the more dangerous position we are in. I love that. On top of a building, you're a lot farther from the ground. You've got a lot farther way to fall down. And, and that's what the enemy wants. He, he, wants a, he, he relishes the opportunity to destroy those who are in positions of authority. And that's why we see, uh, well, don't see it so much just simply because they don't have as much, I don't know, public appreciation as they once had these uh, televangelists who have in the past fallen from grace. They did. They were in a much higher position. As you spoke, they were up there on that scaffold way too high. They needed, they had the opportunity to be a blessing to multitudes of people. But because of their failure, because they fell from such a high lifted up position, that went a long way to destroy the, the, the way people perceive Christianity in this current country. 
and for that matter in the world. And it only, it's only taken a few. I mean, it's only taken a handful of individuals to destroy the perception that people have of Christianity as a whole. I mean, I can only think of a very few. I'm not going to name any names. I'm sure we all have some individual in our mind that we're thinking of. But think about, I'm not saying this is the only cause of the situation that we're in now with Christianity being so um, disrespected by the world. Uh, I know that there are plenty of people who are doing that today who have that attitude that causes Christianity to be, to be disrespected because they're not living up to it. But I think about the country's view of Christianity, the respect that people had for Christians 40 years ago compared to the respect that people have or the lack of respect that people have for Christianity, Christians as a whole today. Now, uh, think about 35, 40 years ago, even if you weren't a Christian, you were respected those who were for their, for their stand. You had a respect for their integrity, if nothing else. But now, uh, integrity is not a word that most people would even associate with Christianity. It's, it's like the opposite of Christianity, according to the view of, of many outside of uh, church organizations today. That makes this warning that we're reading in this lesson all more applicable to us. That we would allow God to have His way in us so that even if the world looks at Christianity with a negative attitude, when they look at us, they don't see that. They don't see the same thing that they see when others call themselves Christians. Brother Chris, I think it's important for us uh, to remember what the Bible said in Matthew, the greatest shall be your servant. That's exactly right. When we go back, when we're talking about history and looking back at the morality of mm -hmm. the world, really, and, and Christianity's influence on the world, mm -hmm. When Christianity had the most influence, it was when there was a mindset of servanthood. Right. And when, as, as Christianity as a whole, not just we as the church or any one group of people, Christianity as a whole, when we started losing that mindset, the, the influence that we had started diminishing. Exactly. Because we were lifting ourselves up right. rather than being that servant. And I think it's important for us to realize as well, uh, as I was sitting here thinking, uh, I began just to pray to myself, you know, Lord, help me mm -hmm. that the farther I go in you, whether it's a pastor, whether, you know, I'm ever a district overseer or ever, quote unquote, rise through the ranks, so to speak, right. that I keep that mentality in the forefront of my mind, the higher higher that I go, the greater servant that I am. Right. Uh, but it's also important for us to remember the flip side. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Nick brought out a great analogy there. Mm -hmm. The higher we get, uh, working at EMS, fire and <laughs> rescue, and as I did, uh, we were always trained. Uh, those big lights and sirens and big red trucks, uh, while people have a respect for them, they carry an authority with them, right. the reality of it is it just makes them a much bigger target. Right. right. Uh, when, you, when you go through a stop sign in one of those or a stoplight in one of those, you just became a bigger target. Right. Uh, because your, your attention is drawn. Uh, we need to realize as well when we begin to lift others up, mm -hmm. we are placing them in a position to become a bigger target as well. Right. Uh, and we're giving a greater susceptibility of them falling along the way because we're lifting them up so much that they can't achieve what we believe that they are. Right. And then therefore they're going to fall mm -hmm. in our eyes, uh, if nothing else, which will diminish the impact of the ministry. Uh, we've got to remember that anytime 
the spirit of superiority. Uh, it goes back to pride. Right, that's, that's it. What it is. That's exactly right. In the, in the grand scheme of things, and, and pride, while we can have a pride that God is capable of keeping us through everything, <laughs> Uh, pride in ourselves, mm -hmm. in man whatsoever, will always lead to destruction. Absolutely. I think that's something that we we need to understand, all of us, everybody, not not just the ministry, not just laity, not just people in the church, but everybody uh, who would consider themselves a Christian need to understand is the word minister. If you look up the original, it means a servant. It is literally a servant. And when we remember that, it's not a leader. It's not someone who's uh, authority. Like it's not, it's not about authority, but it's about servanthood. It's about serving the people. And I, I, I love the analogy that was given. I, I just feel compelled to, to repeat it. Uh, Nick said earlier, working in construction, Talking about you work on the ground. I think I'm thinking about it. this. This is what's going through my mind. Walking on the ground, you you do want to watch out for things you might you might trip over. There there are plenty of things that that could trip us up here on the ground. But you know that if you fall, me, my head's only going to fall about six feet, and my hands are right there to catch me, unless something's really really twisted or something. I get hung up. But when I'm up on scaffolding, when I'm up higher, I am going to be far more careful with where I put my feet. <laughs> Making sure I better have a security harness on, something to keep me from hitting the ground. Because if I'm up high, the damage that's going to be done to my body is, is far greater. That's what the Bible is. That's our safety line. <laughs> it's a good analogy as well. But what happens, and it's what happens in construction as well, when we're so comfortable walking around at those heights, we're less concerned with, with what's around us. We pay less attention to what's going on around us because we're comfortable. We've been in these situations for so long. I think about some of the pictures I've seen and it just it makes me sick, literally sick to my stomach, seeing these pictures of people up on these high-rise construction projects, way up in the air, no safety harness, and just standing on a steel I-beam. Hundred, maybe hundreds of feet between them and the ground. They're just standing there. They've become far too comfortable with where they are. Yes. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. it will take us 
Well, the Lord, there's nothing the Lord can't do with us if we right. always keep that in mind and at the forefront of everything that we do. Yeah. And I'm like you, brother. God, help me. God, help me. Yeah, but Jesus I'm said, greater things shall you do because I go to the Father. And I, I love, I just, this, this has been such a good analogy and thinking about it. But we need, we need to be aware. Always be aware of who we are. And if there's any good in us, it's, it's not us. But it's God working through us. Right. We better go back to that over and over and over again because that's what's going to keep us. The closer we are to it, the safer we are. It doesn't matter the positions we're in. Right. It doesn't matter the where we are or what we're doing. It doesn't matter that I work at the United States. Right. Uh, at the end of the day, if I at any point in time allow myself to succumb to the enemy attack. Mm -hmm. People do way more damage to themselves thinking about construction and damage. Uh, nine times out of ten, it's not the wind that actually knocks somebody off the building, but it's them trying to regain their balance after the fact. Yeah. Uh, it's trying to step back into that. Uh, if we allow ourselves, the enemy can't defeat us, but he can come and blow, and we can try to come back. Mm hmm and many times do more destruction. And if we're relying on the safety thing, uh, you know, I, I said this before, and, and I want to be careful in saying this. I love the church, but if I'm relying on the church to save me, mm -hmm. that helmet is great when you're eight feet off the ground. <laughs> but when you get to 80 feet, it doesn't matter if you, how good your helmet is. I've seen helmets split and half on impact. Absolutely. Uh, it will not save you. Right. You've got to go back to the one thing. Right. And, and that's the Word of God. It's what our foundation has to go back to. Right. Something that made me think of is uh, when you are working high, still, it's still a good idea to try to stay low. Because <laughs> 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 you were talking about balance. And, Absolutely. Absolutely. Multiple, multiple times. But when you say there's safety in the church, you have to be careful. Absolutely. You say that. Because, like um, Brother Christian said, the church is not going to save you. Right. And leadership will fail you. People will fail you. All the time. Absolutely. But Christ will not fail you. Right. The Bible will not direct you wrong. Right. Well, and also, it, when you talk about different people were talking about people being lifted up. If you go back to the office of a bishop, mm -hmm. he says not a novice. Right. And I believe that we've allowed some novice people to become bishops mm -hmm. to lift them up. Whether we needed work done quickly and we thought, well, they can't do this unless they're a bishop, let's put them in the bishop. 
if you really get down to the nitty gritty on all of that, the plan of God for our vision is all laid out. Mm -hmm. And if we don't follow that, we could uh, put them, well, basically, we're all in the devil's path, but we're putting right. him on the front line. Right. You know, do you want someone that's a novice on the front line right. in the battlefield? You don't. Right. Because they could be looking at themselves and not paying attention to the battle ahead of them. Right. And um, those are just things that, you know, the church has to think about. But yeah. ultimately, Christ and the Word of God is our true safety. Absolutely. Not anybody or anything else. We like to look at people and say, this, that, or the other, or right. the church or whatever. And we put on those things. Mm -hmm. Like somebody said, they had on everything, right? But not the safety line, right? Hello, that's one thing you really need. <laughs> well, yeah. But we forget those things. We, we, we want to pick up what we want. We mm -hmm. pick and choose what we want to have right. with us. And I appreciate what you said there. It made me think uh, talking about the church as it is safety. The church is safety, but it's like steel toe boots and a helmet. We, I mean, we who are alive and, and here today can look back and see that the church has failed in the past. We can see that. Not because our ancestors have told us about, uh, those who have came before us have told us about it, but those who are here today have experienced it, have lived through it. And then we can go back in our history and we can see that it happened before that as well. Absolutely. Things that have been dug up. Absolutely. We're not digging anymore. We, we're relying on the safety harness. It's sad to oh, say. Oh, 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 go do ahead. Do you not replace your safety harness? <laughs> How often do you have to replace your safety harness? They have to be inspected every so many months. There's a tag on there. There's any damage that needs to be replaced. Immediately has to be replaced, yes. We have to make sure that that safety harness is up. I mean, oh, I'm yeah. about not the Bible, yeah. <laughs> not new translations. Not new translations, not this or that. <laughs> not new light. Sure, and I believe that God was trying to tell us 30 years ago we need to add um, the threads of love to that safety harness because right. that safety harness did not have the threads of love in it and right. it needs to be added. Absolutely. To that That's harness. excellent, excellent points. I, I love this. <laughs> this is. We're not even to the golden truth, and this has been such an amazing lesson so far. And I think we're, we're grasping the concept of the importance. I'm not complaining about what everybody said. I appreciate what everybody said, and everybody's had wonderful input. But we're truly grasping the importance of the title of this lesson in the words that we're speaking. What was that title? The Gentiles' Warning. Everything that we've said, everything that everybody has said this morning is critical to understanding the warning that this lesson and Paul, by extension, was trying to get across to us. People fail. We all have a potential for failure. We need to be aware of that. And the closer we stick to the Bible... The more time we spend connected, how do we stay connected to, how do you put on a harness? It, it takes effort. There, there are things that you have to do. There's a, a procedure that takes place to put that harness on. And so it is with the Word of God. Owning a Bible doesn't save you. That's, owning a harness is, is a wonderful thing if you, if you work construction, owning one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> But if you just own that harness, but you don't use it, it serves no benefit. If you own a Bible, but you don't use it, it's just as useless. Or if you own a Bible, and as Sister Wendy picked out, pointed out, you pick the parts and pieces that you like, you're wearing it improperly. And that's just as dangerous, if not more so, than not wearing it. If you fall from a a survivable height. I, I know I think I've heard people say that 20 feet is, is that, say, that there's a potential for, for life. You could potentially live, a, 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 you could survive a fall from around 20 feet. It's possible. Anything more than that, there's a high, much higher risk of death. 
Say you're in that fall around that area and you have your harness on improperly. It could snap your neck. You might have survived the fall if you'd had the harness on properly. You might have survived the fall if you didn't have the harness on at all. But because you had that safety net, that protection improperly uh, utilized, you were dead. You killed. It killed you. Exactly. And and you may have felt safe because well, I've got my harness on. You may have felt safe. Well, I own a Bible. I like, the, I, like this word, I like this book. I like that book. I don't like that book. I don't like that chapter. I don't like this verse. We need to be careful. Yes? Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's interesting what says in Romans. what the Apostle Paul says in Romans. <clears throat> I have really struggled to be able to understand this lesson. I was studying it and studying it. And praying. But it's been hard for me to connect with it. But it's been hard for me to connect with it. But I want to share something. The golden truth. No te ensoberbezcas ante Esther. Que si Dios no perdonó a las ramas naturales, a ti tampoco no perdona. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he, spare, lest he also spare not thee. Ahora, ¿a quién, Dios, a quién el apóstol Pablo está molestando? Who is it the apostle Paul is warning? Conforme a la, la escritura y a la, y a la lección. According to the scripture and the lesson. Está molestando a la iglesia de miembros. Eh, he's warning a predominantly Gentile member church. Ahora, vamos un poco más atrás. But going a little bit before, <coughs> further back. Cuando, hermanos, entró este espíritu de, 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 de soberbia? When did the spirit of high-mindedness come in? Cuando entró, hermano, desde donde viene este espíritu de, de, uh, de orgullo? Where did the spirit of pride come in? Oh, yeah, that's easy. <laughs> Okay. Vamos a tocar estos puntos porque hay algo que se ha compartido. And there's something that um, that we'll talk about, but la Biblia me enseña the Bible tells me que el pueblo de Israel that the, the, the uh, people of Israel estuvo por un tiempo they were there for a time sin que Dios hablase without God speaking to them. Mm -hmm. Estamos de acuerdo, ¿verdad? And we, we all see that, right? Okay. ¿Qué pasa, hermano, cuando no hay un cuando no hay un mensaje, cuando no hay un pastor. What happens when there's not a message or when there's not a, a pastor? Mm -hmm. ¿Qué fue lo que pasó con Israel? What happened with Israel? ¿Qué espíritu fue el que se, se, uh, se apoderó de ellos? What uh, spirit had taken over them? Vemos que a través del Antiguo Testamento Dios estaba molestando a través de los profetas. And we can see that the, um, the Old Testament, the, they were being warned by the prophets. Pero de Malaquías. But from Malachi. Uh, 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 de Malaquías al, a, al Evangelio de San Mateo. To the Gospel of Matthew. Vemos que hay un tiempo. We see that there was a time. Donde Dios no, no molesta. When God wasn't warning them. Entonces, ¿cómo estaba caminando el pueblo? So how, was the, how were the people walking then? Entonces, cuando Cristo se presenta. And so when Jesus comes. Cuando, cuando Juan el Bautista se presenta. And when John the Baptist came. ¿Cómo estaban? How were they? Cada quien tenía una religión. Every one of them had their own religion. Y la Biblia lo, 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 lo menciona hasta con nombre. And the, the Bible talks about those uh, groups that are given by name. Había como cinco grupos There were religiosos. Like six different right. or five different religious groups. Y cada groups. quien creía lo suyo. And everyone believed their own thing. Pero right. la sorpresa fue. But the surprise was. Cuando viene Juan el Bautista. When John the uh, Baptist came. Y comienza a predicar del arrepentimiento. And he started to preach about repentance. <laughs> ¿Por qué fue necesario que viniese Juan el Bautista? 
why was it necessary for John the Baptist to come? Porque lo que estaban haciendo los grupos religiosos because what the religious groups were doing no era correcto delante de Dios. It wasn't correct in the eyes of God. Y ahora viene Cristo. And now here comes Jesus. Y también la molesta, y usted mencionó una escritura. And you mentioned some scriptures and he, he warned. A los fariseos de los escritos. And for mm -hmm. that, he warned the Pharisees and scribes. Ahora, había un espíritu. There was a spirit. Que estaba dominando. That was dominating. Right. Pero no era conforme a la voluntad de Dios. But it wasn't right. from, it wasn't according to the will of God. Ahora, ellos se sentían muy orgullosos. They felt very pride. Mm -hmm. Pride. Y era de reconocerlo porque era un pueblo escogido. And they, they uh, were. That they were they were recognized because they were a chosen people. Pero cuando vemos en Romanos, but we see in what we see in Romans. Ese espíritu, when we see this spirit in Romans, de sentirse especial y orgulloso, says that um, of feeling special and pride. Pasa lo it goes to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Ahora, y ese espíritu, hasta ahí quedó. And it, did it stay there? O todavía está operando. Or is it still working now? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. Ahora. El punto es este, que se ha mencionado de que la Biblia es el cinto so the, the Bible is the, the safety belt. de seguridad. Pero sabe que vamos a hablar de esta iglesia. But, you know, we'll talk about this esta iglesia, si, un, si, 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 si no está el pastor if que it, ha sido o, o, o este, nombrado para este lugar, for example, if, if the pastor that's been appointed is not, if, if this church were without a pastor, para este rebaño, la, flock, las ovejas van a comenzar a ser lo que ellos quieren. The, the flock's going to begin to do begin to do whatever they want to do. Okay, es interesante lo que dice el apóstol Pablo. And it's interesting what the apostle Paul says. En lo que dice en, en, el, en el capítulo 12, verso 16. In chapter 12, verse 17. Unánimes entre vosotros, no altivos, mas acomodándoos a, a los humildes, no seáis sabios en vuestras opiniones. Mm -hmm. 12, 16. Oh, sorry, verse 16. 12 verse 16, be of the same mind one toward another, mm -hmm. mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. Ahora, ¿verá que habla de unidad? So it's talking about unity. ¿Dónde vamos a ver la unidad? Where, where, where will we see the unity? Well, le voy a poner un ejemplo, usted en su casa. For example, you're at home. Y yo en mi casa. And I'm at home. A gusto, ¿verdad? And we're happy there. Tomaron una taza de café. Having some coffee. Leyendo la palabra. Reading the word of God. <laughs> pues, no hay ningún problema. No problem. Ya que es necesario que estemos en donde en donde que se va a ver la unidad. But where will we see the unity? No es en la iglesia. Is it at, at the church? Mm -hmm. Y la iglesia la conformamos todos. Pero qué pasa cuando hay problemas? But what happens whenever there's problems? Qué pasa cuando se está manifestando ese espíritu el que identificó el apóstol Pablo? And what happens when the spirit that the apostle Paul identified starts to manifest itself? Mm -hmm. Cada quien hermano. Everyone. Yep. Opta por irse. Mm -hmm. Leaves. Uno se van para Idaho, One goes to Idaho. Otro para California. For California. ¿Por qué? Porque no queremos. Because we don't want. Mm -hmm. Luchar por la unidad. We don't want to fight for unity. Y comienzo yo a ver los errores de hermano. Mm -hmm. And we start to see our brothers No, que el hermano ya no está bien. Our, we see our brothers not well, not doing good. En vez de orar con él. Instead of praying with him. Hacer la fuerza. And make the effort. Orar pero orar a Dios. Pray but pray to God. Orar juntos. And pray together. Para que veamos la gloria de Dios juntos. So that we see the glory of God together. Porque cuando venga el rapto, comes, no solamente él se va a ir. It's not just him that's going to go. Yo también tengo que ir. Right. I have to leave. I have Pero to si he luchado, yo. Si he luchado, but me if, voy a ir. But if, 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 if I've struggled, I'm not going to. Y ese es el problema, hermano. And this is the problem. Mm -hmm. Hemos visto muchos problemas de parte del enemigo, que han, muchos ataques del enemigo que han venido a nuestras vidas. We've seen mm -hmm. a lot of attacks from the enemy come to our lives. Pero me ha llevado a ver el problema suyo. But I've been driven to see the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ¿Me entiende? Entonces, es necesario. <clears throat> usted mencionó algo muy importante y me llamó la atención. And you mentioned something that's very important that, that, um, that struck me. Cuando el hermano comentó de la, de la altura. When mm -hmm. the brother was talking about height. ¿Cuántos ministros, cuántos evangelistas han estado en, altu eh, 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 en, cierto, en cierta altura? How many ministers, evangelists have mm -hmm. been at a very high place? ¿Pero qué ha pasado cuando han caído? But what's happened when they've fallen? Right. ¿Qué ha pasado? What's happened? ¿Verdad que el, el, la, las almas que nos seguían ya, ya, no, ya, no, ya, no, ya no creen? The, uh, the souls that, that, that uh, the, the souls that influence, they influence no longer believe. Y right. esa parte, hermano. And when we see that, es importante. It is important. Que haya un pastor. That, that there is a pastor que nos right. predique, or a shepherd that can, preach, that can feed. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Absolutely. Pero tenemos que hacerlo en la unidad. But we have to do it in unity. Ahora, no es que usted le va a llevar al cielo. And it's not that you're going to take me to heaven. Pero Dios right. tiene una responsabilidad con usted. But God does have a responsibility para for poder you traer el mensaje. To be able to bring the message. Absolutely. Hay, hay puntos, hermano, de que, que necesitamos que Dios nos ayude. And there's a lot of things, a lot of points that God y es needs, tiempo. needs to help us and it's time. Es tiempo. Que ese espíritu de división that the spirit of division mm -hmm. salga. Is gone. Dios no constituyó, no organizó su iglesia, hermano. No estableció su iglesia nomás así por, por casualidad. Right now. Right now. Necesitamos. La Biblia dice que te, necesitamos estar unánime. Right now. Esto, hermano, But for, the, for that, tenemos que hacer una fuerza. We have to, it has to be an effort. Also. Ahora, yo estoy haciendo la fuerza que usted está haciendo. And, and am I making the same effort though as you are? O ya no hago. Or is I, am I not making the same effort? O ya no lucho. Am I not right struggling? Right now. Los apóstoles, hermano. The apostles. Ellos es, estuvieron dispuestos a pagar ese precio. They were, they were willing to pay that price. Mire el apóstol Pedro. Look at the apostle Peter. Mire Bernabé. And Bar Barnabas. Dos personajes. Two people. Santos. Lleno del poder de Dios. Full of the power of God. Pero batallaron. But they struggled. Mm -hmm. Pero el apóstol Pablo. But the apostle Paul. Fue diligente. Was diligent. Para ayudarlos a ellos. To help them. Y poder entender. And que habían caído en un error. Help them to understand that they had fallen in error. Right. ¿Quién estaba detrás de todo esto? Right. Who was behind all of that? Claro, el enemigo. Of course, the enemy Pero was. el apóstol Pablo se paró firme. But the apostle Paul stood firm. Mm -hmm. All right, right, I'm going to have to stop you because I'm running out of time. I appreciate what you said. Everything, it's, it's very good, very important. Uh, I do have just a few more words I'd like to say before we close out. Um, but part of the problem that we're facing today in the church is we're allowing the influence of the world into us. Not necessarily that sinful influence, but we're allowing that divisive influence, that polarizing influence that, that pervades every aspect of our lives outside of the church. I think about in the political arena. I think about in the sports arena. Anything, anything that people have in their minds, this is the way it has to be, and anything else that's different is completely wrong. And I hate you because you don't believe the same way I believe. Or even just at work. Yeah, Employee absolutely. Versus the... Employees versus the bosses or anything. Employees versus employees, bosses versus bosses. There are so many things that this world is influencing us to have these polarized thoughts. We, it can only be this way or it can only be that way. And what Wendy said earlier is critical to all of our understanding of getting back to where we need to be. We no longer fight for the truth. We fight for our opinions of the truth. And so what we need to do is get back to those days uh, when, as, uh, as it was written, they crawled on their hands and knees in search of the truth. We don't do that anymore. We don't feel any need to because just like the Pharisees and Sadducees, we have the church, the church has this belief that we have everything and we don't need anything else. We don't need to dig for any more truth because we already have it. This is exactly what Jesus was preaching against when He spoke to the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is exactly what Paul was warning against when he was speaking to the Roman congregation. He was warning us, we can't be satisfied with where we are. We can't be satisfied with what we have. <coughs> We can't think we're perfect. Well, the Jews were rejected, so it must be us. Now we're perfect, and we can do whatever we want. That's not the way it works. That's why the Jews fell. And that's why Paul is speaking to them right now. He's saying, that's why they fell. Don't take the same attitude, or you're going to fall as well. I want to read something real quick here. i got a minute, and I'm not going to. I'm going to go over uh, sorry, no more, no more, no more comments. Sorry, <laughs> never happened before, but I got, I got to go. 
He reminds these Roman Gentiles that their being reconciled to God was a result of Israel's being cast away. Therefore, Israel was due their respect since they as Gentiles were, being, were benefiting from Israel's stumbling. The same is true today. Those who have fallen away were lost in their own transgressions. Whether as individuals or as an organization, we have no authority to exalt ourselves over those who have fallen away. Those who came before us paved the way for our current positions, whether they remained faithful or fell away. Those, those organizations that came before us also played a part in the plan of God. The Catholic Church played a part in the plan of God. If we begin to lift ourselves up, we're heading down the same path toward destruction. It's important that we recognize who we are as God's people. But it's just as important that we understand that it is by God's mercy and not our own perfection that we are where we are today. Chosen status is based on obedience to God. When the Jews were lifted up and began to boast in their chosen status under the law, they were rejected. When those who came after them were lifted up and began to think of themselves as superior to the Jews who had paved the path to salvation, they were warned of the same dangers. Those who pressed forward were rejected, while those who ceased this behavior went forward to reach the lost. This was the warning of Paul in the early days of the church. And this is the same warning. The same warning is just as applicable now as it was then. Romans 11, 20 and 21 still speaks to us nearly 2,000 years later. Be not high-minded but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest He also spare not thee. There's so much more to say here this morning, not just myself, but everyone. I think we could, we could probably do two or three more lessons on this one lesson, but I'm already over, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over.